so ahead of the weekend in an All Ireland contenders context, we made the point here in the show. Well, a first outing for Dublin, Kerry, and Galway. Let's see what we find out. I think there's probably a touch more to say about Galway than the other two based on those games of the weekend. Oh, God, for sure, yeah. Um, let's be honest, they're probably not even worth talking about. They were just complete write offs. Um, Galway, look at what, what we learned about Galway or in that they're, they're probably improving in many aspects in that they don't have to play or be at their best to, to win games and you know were they at their best on Sunday no they weren't but you know there, there's a bit of resilience now about Galway you have to say and Cork Joyce has instilled that in, in the team and it's probably something you wouldn't always associate them probably before last year but they have built this resilience up through the through the last couple of years in particular. And, and and like on Sunday, it was almost a game they had to go and win twice. Like the first, that game should have been over at halftime, Joe. You know, they were they were so in control. Was common were so, so passive in 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 their play and both their defensive play and their and their attacking play. And that can happen, I think, when you when you set your team up and it's all about containment and it's all about, you know, stopping the opposition and sitting back inside your 45 and protecting the D area like they did against Mayo. It didn't work as well against Galway. Obviously, there was a couple of there was a couple of t- key things in that. The weather was a small bit better, which allowed Galway to control it a small bit more. I think they would have learned from what went wrong against Mayo and carrying the ball down the middle channel. And Galway were very happy just to play the ball on the perimeters of that around the D area. The, Roscommon almost had a, a curved U shaped defence around there, but they were so so passive. They never looked to go out and push uh, Galway and make tackles or turnovers and. Even when they were in possession, Joe, they were passive, you know, and that, and that can happen. And players like Inda Smith and Jira Murta, Tony Smith, you know, uh, Kira Murta was well, a very good second half, but I think their game plan slightly changed in the first half. They were just, they were they were too deep. They were protecting their own D and a system like that isn't going to get the best out of them boys, you know. And look, Roscommon were far better in the second half, obviously, um, and, and go, we pushed on from there. But uh, yeah, from Galway, yeah, they're, they're going to be thereabouts for sure. It is a funny trend we can see at times in high octane do or die championship matches whereby a defence gets set, gets organised and then almost forgets we need to get in the faces Mm. of the opposition here. We need to engage. I need to get hands on them. I need to make their life miserable. I don't know why you think that happens. Is there almost a degree of being so focused on our spacing and our organisation that we're forgetting that this is also a, a physical contest? Usually, Joe. Like, like I said, it was almost a, a zone of defence where they were in a, a U, U curve shape and it's like, OK, we're not pushing out made tackles. No one's going to make a foul so they get a score of a free. And if they come into the zone, then we'll push out and look to make a tackle. I think Galway were very cute in the way they moved the ball you know, they weren't really going into the zones where Rathcommon wanted them to go unless it was completely on. But you're 100% right. That can lead to a team just being completely lethargic. You know, and, and Davy Burke nearly mentioned it in the in his interview post-game where he thought his team lacked energy in the first half. But I think that's more of a, a mindset thing. Like, nothing creates energy, Joe, better than, obviously, scores, number one. But pushing out, making tackles, making turnovers, getting a bit of buzz in the crowd and then attacking with pace. Like Roscommon only two shots from playing the first half, Joe. They scored three three frees, I think it was. Um, they obviously got a score from play early in the second half. But even against Mayo, they didn't score a point from play until the 50th minute. Mm. You know, granted, they get the two goals from play in the first half. But when you're playing that system, you're heavily reliant on goals because they're not going to score enough points. And the likes yeah. of Murta, Ben O'Carroll was really, you know, for a young player, he was, it, was, it was a lonely role he had up top for Roscommon because he's basically the only fourth they had up there when Roscommon got the ball. So I thought Roscommon looked quite clueless when they got the ball in the first half as well because it looked like they'd no plan or structure what to do, how to break out of the fence. A couple of times they held the ball for two or three minutes and then just launched a high ball inside to to, to the goal with full back line, which they dealt with early. But, you know, obviously they improved a lot in the second half. I think they made a couple of changes in the Smith played higher up the pitch Kieran Murta played higher on the pitch and the introduction of Keane McEwan to the half forward line gave them a bit of energy and a, and a bit of pace and you know he made a huge difference and it definitely put Galway on the back foot and Galway looked like they were they were in a small bit of trouble midway through that second half. Well that's interesting because well to stay at Roscommon for a moment we'll come back to Galway. Mm. Jim McGuinness in the Irish Times his read on their tactics was that there was certainly a real method to it that they didn't want numbers crossing the 45 they were leaving two men up top in a bid to create some kind of space for them 
But he said, so he said, so far so good. But what seemed to happen was that uh, Galway were able to put in what he called a, a strong mid-block press. I guess it's kind of a soccer term, but you take the point. So uh, Galway were able to get your sheer volume of numbers around the middle of the pitch. It was very congested. Roscommon weren't putting numbers past the 45. They were trying to leave space inside. But the consequence of that was incredibly congested in midfield. And so very hard for any Roscommon player to put in good quality ball because they were generally under pressure. And so it all just looked a bit uh, flat and, 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 and lacking any kind of coherence. But, but there was the bones of a plan there. Galway did very well maybe to, to snuff it out. Oh, they did for sure. But... I think Roscommon made it easy for them, Joe, okay. just by the sheer numbers that was back number one. But I don't remember at a Roscommon attack in the first half where they literally attacked at pace, where a couple of lines just broke the shoulder and they looked up and got a kick pass. Like you mentioned McGuinness there in 2012, and mm. like he, his teams were the king of the counter attack and the quick counter attacks. And like the buzz that that generated in the crowd when Johnny Gall made a turnover and you'd have four or five boys just sprinting out of the back with the ball. Yeah. Never saw that from us coming on Sunday. And and I think the gap between the likes of Ben O'Carr, Jira Murta, and the rest of the team was too big. You know, they simply had no outlet in their half forward line. So okay. if they did win a turnover in defence, okay, where's my outlet here in the half forward line? Is there a 30 metre kick pass on? Yes. It wasn't on. No one there to kick it up. You need to bridge those two up the yes. other end of the pitch a bit better. Yeah, fair point. Mm. On Galway, so it's always I think it's always insightful to see what a manager says afterwards in terms of why they think they won the game. It, it, whether they're right or wrong, it, it speaks uh, to what they're working on in training. And so Joyce, his logic was that we were striving, I suppose, for control. He said that is the big thing for us. We don't panic. We don't get too excited. And when we were under the cosh, it was a case of us minding the ball and just keeping the ball and moving around. That's almost Dublin-esque in a way. Mm. We'll keep possession, we'll take the sting out of it. They sound like a team who've got a lot of boxes ticked and they're layering now and, and they're into that, that stage of like game management. Do, do you think they're in a good place when it comes to that element of the game? Dublin, obviously, the masters of it, but Joyce talking about control, exerting control. Yeah, and, and like I think Keen O'Neill has had a huge amount to do with this, Joe, because it's just the way he thinks about the game, how smart he is. Um, and sure, you can see, like I mentioned, the way they held the ball in the first half. Mm. They weren't going to make the same mistakes that Mayo did and run the ball down the middle, challenge into Roscommon players and, and risk the chance of turning over the ball. They, I think the key thing, you know, they talk about how they slowed the game down the second half when it was going against them. I think I think the boy showed it actually, Fall Flynn highlighted it Sunday night in the Sunday game that just literally... They were up against it. Roscommon hit 1-3 without reply and Galway held the ball for two or three minutes after that and just took the sting out of the game. And I think they got a score then that just set them down and they man they managed then to get the momentum back that they'd lost during the first half. And yeah, you're right. It's elements of, of Dublin. It's elements of a team that, that know what they're doing, that have a plan and have confidence to carry out that plan as well, you know, and, and have the belief in, in, in what they're doing. So... Galway are a serious prospect. There's no doubt about Joe. They have the elements, you know, and Burke, you know, Burke and Cook, you saw what they brought to the, the table, especially book the, uh, Burke the last day and, and John Harrow in midfield looks a real fine. Like it's going to be really interesting to see when Killy McDade now is back fully fit, where he's going to fit in because Mar has been, he was brilliant in the league finally, took out Manny Ruan, took out into Smith the last day from midfield, you know, so there, that's two serious um, things to have in your CV so, so early in the year. So, it's going to be really interesting to see, you know, will McDay be an impact sub now or is he, is he going to come in somewhere else in the team? Back in the day, when Dublin kept the ball for two, three, four minutes, mm. made the pitch big and it finished up in a score, that always struck me as so demoralising for the opposition. Mm. Oh, yeah, sure it was. Yeah, you're bringing back bad memories now. It was. And... Almost the harder you try to make them not score, you know, you, the worse it was. And the longer it went on, so if it was, if it was a short period of time, it nearly wouldn't be as bad. But you could feel the sense in the crowd that they were trying to get the shot off or they were trying to work the ball to a scoring zone. And once they got there, then, because you were felt like you were chasing that ball for two or three minutes and you'd almost be, the energy would be nearly zapped from you by chasing them around the place for the two or three minutes. So when you got the kick out then, they were naturally all pressed up the field <laughs> against you as well. And they were putting the pressure right back on you again and trying to win the ball. And that's, I think Paddy Andrews speaks very well of this on the football pad. That's what they do. They, they'd held the ball so they get, everyone gets up the pitch then. 
and then they press the next kick out and you're, and you're right back under pressure again. So to follow that kind of theme of control, which is where Galway are striving to get mm. to with a view to an All-Ireland final, the lads in the football pod, for instance, were talking about Shane Walsh, who is mercurial and brilliant, but he is prone on occasion to playing a crossfield ball that isn't on mm. and give away possession. And uh, Paddy Andrews made the point, if that happened on a Dublin side, there would be war in the dressing room. It's just mm. unacceptable. That kind of a decision, that kind of, you know, your Walsh, you're capable of anything, you see it, it's on, you probably could pull it off and, and then you don't. That kind of a moment can cost you a game when we get into the business end of the championship. So uh, where are you on that balance between like allowing a Walsh to express himself but also like cooler heads have to prevail here? This isn't about just expressing yourself either. Oh, and Joe, I was I was in that exact corner last year against Armagh where Walsh tried that kick pass across the field and Armagh came up the field, got an equaliser and the game goes to extra time, you know, that's, and that was the five margins of trouble on that game. He tried something similar the last day, it didn't have the same results or the same consequences, should we say, but sometimes, you know, it would be interesting to see what happened after the game. Is that spoken about when they went back to training, well, probably back to training tonight or tomorrow night, will that be spoke about? And sometimes the best thing, Joe, if... if that does come from the players rather than Power Joyce, you know, picking out in a video analysis session. If it was the likes of a Comer or John Daly and a Conroy standing up in a, set, in a video analysis, say, look at lads, Shane, you can't be doing this five minutes to go in a game, a risky cross feed ball, and us get a, us a chance of giving the team a, a counteract and put a, a chance of counterattacking us. But the other side of that is, is Walsh the type of player who takes that in, or do you want to take that away from him either? You know, it's a fine, fine balance because. You know, if you go back to the Ireland final last year, some of them shots what Walsh took on, you know, if in a normal guy, you're probably you're telling him not to take them on. You know what I mean? You're saying they're outside your scoring zone. Some of them shots are madness, but Walsh is the type of player that can land them. So you it's a fine balance because you don't want to take that that kind of genius from them too, you know. But obviously in it has to be a bit more controlled for sure. Yeah. And I suppose game management is the key thing here at the times of the games that it's happening. Is it your sense that uh you know, some are more equal than others, even on uh, Mayo teams, are certain players more allowed to shoot from certain positions than a Colin Boyle might be? <laughs> For sure, yeah. It, well, look, you, you, you always hear this, the, the famous phrase, get your shooters on the ball at the best time. So if you need a score the last minute of the game, you're trying to get the ball to Killian O'Connor. Yeah. You know, you're trying to get the ball to Andy Moore, someone who's, who's an 8 or 10 or a 9 or a 10. So and, that's, and that's if, kind if of Killian, obvious. If Killian tries one on his left foot, from a bad angle from 40 metres. Mm. Afterwards, is there a degree of, you're Killian, if you thought it was on, it was on, or is there still room to go, what are you thinking there? Come on. Yeah, I suppose it depends on the scenario and the game. If you're talking about an Ireland final, it's the last kick of the game. Like, remember the one Killian kicked to, to level the one in in, yes. in 2016? That la- It was pretty much the last kick of the game. Like, it was a difficult kick in, in, in horrible circumstances. Colin, Colin Boyle's not allowed to take that on. I'm not. I'm, I'm not taking it on anyway, George. <laughs> yeah, only <laughs> Killing takes that shot. But, you know, Killing goes looking for that ball as well and gets that shot. And I suppose what I'm saying is, if that drops ten yards short, we're all kind of thinking, Killing, what are you doing taking that shot on? But some players like Killing, like a Shane Walsh, have to say, you know, there is certain circumstances where maybe then guys that they have that bit of genius and can yeah. pull that bit of magic and get you out of a hole on a, on a big big day. Yes. But there is a difference, I suppose, is what you're saying is there. Is, there is a difference between that and a David Beckham Hollywood crossfield pass. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Sir. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And the time. The time was key, Joe. Like Walsh has passed the last day. He he actually ran into the corner when there was no need to run. He nearly invited Ross Commons in. Ross Common players in. And to be honest, I think his legs were gone, Joe. And he was thinking, I need to get rid of this ball. And he just hit. He hit a crossfield ball without even looking, really. But. Yeah. Probably he probably if he held it and got caught for over carrying and get involved in a bit of a wrestling match, it probably would have served his team a small bit better, you know. Yeah, you know it's funny and and you'd be able to speak of this. I would say you knew all of your teammates intimately on the pinch. Mm. You knew what they could see and what they couldn't see, and some had better vision than others. And you know that that's one of the lovely things of I, I I I my own more limited experience of being in a team is you have this understanding of everybody. That's very hard, I think, for those on the outside to to penetrate. Mm. I don't know whether. Walsh is one of those types that like if you said it to him after training he'd be saying oh geez of course yeah no no it wasn't on but then he to the moment he's like oh I can't help myself or you know there, there, some players will agree with you after the fact but in, in the heat you almost need to roar at them you can anticipate what they're about to do and say don't 
Yeah, I don't, uh, but I don't decide it was true, Joe. If he pulls that off, and I don't know who he was going for, yeah. it was a Comer, and he gets that off Comer, and Comer puts it off the bar, we're all talking about what a score that sure. was, and brilliant pass from Shane Walsh. So there is a fine line, yeah, of course. Uh, you know, Walsh, like I said earlier, I don't know is Walsh the type of player that you can, you're going to take that out of. I think he's just, he is what he is at this stage. He's he's a genius when he has the ball, but he is going to have that odd moment where he could he'll be on the verge of almost costing his team some stage with mm-hmm. some of his decision making. And we saw that a bit that in the league final as well. There's some tendencies in the last 20 minutes where, you know, maybe if it was a small bit cuter or a small bit smarter and some of the play go, he might actually, you know, won that game in the coming down the closing stages. Yes. And look, I, I think we'd both concede we're making a mountain out of a molehill here, but maybe that's mm-hmm. where Goal, we are. They're into those finer details. You mentioned Ian Burke there as a as a mm. foil for uh, the likes of Walsh and the likes of Comer. He's an all star. I mean, like you know, he's, he, but he's a, he's an interesting player, and uh, he's he's more ball winner, supplier, playmaker than you know. I'm 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 thinking about getting my four or five points. Oh, brilliantly! And uh, look, I come back to the football pal James O'Donnell spoke brilliantly about this this morning. Like he was a huge loss to Galway last year, Joe. And um, like I remember meeting him at the the Galway Mayo game in Casa Bar in the stand, he was sitting a couple of seats in front of me and just basically said, why aren't you there? Like, you know, and he was just saying, he's living in Dublin, you know, he wasn't just feeling it, driving up and down or whatever. You know, players go through that at certain stages, but I'd say watching that Galway team get into the All-Ireland final last year, I'd say he was thinking to himself, you know, I, I need to be back in there. You know, we have a real chance of winning the All-Ireland and he's such a platform for Galway. Like, he's the type of player, if I'm a halfback, on the Galway team, when I get the ball, I'm, I'm looking to see where's Burke because right. you know he's always moving. And if you see him with half a yard, by the time you kick the ball to him, he's actually got three or four yards on his man. He's got that movement. He's got that spring. He's very, very dynamic. And I'd say, like, he is a joy for the rest of the Galway for us to play with. You know, he just gives them a platform, gives them a foil. And like I said, he's not going to kick four or five points in the game. He's not He's not that type of player, but he just brings everyone into the game. And Galway always certainly look a better team when he's in when he is in the team for them. Yeah, that kind of movement is invaluable. And as you said, you oh, get your head yeah. up. I, I'm sure Manny is a time you looked at Andy Moran and said, "God bless you." Yeah, exactly. It's that type of movement, Joe. Yeah, and it's some player, some players you just trust more than others. Mm. So, like same with Andy, if you see Andy with the air, you, you kick it. You don't hesitate because you know by the time you kick it, he's actually gained three or four more yards through movement, through cue play, through using his body. If, even if it is a tighter ball, he nearly rolled the defender as the ball is coming in and nearly win it on the half turn, you know, even even in a better position than what he was. So there's some players, you just see them through training and you see them through playing games and you say, yeah, you, you just have that understanding with them. And I think the Galway players, the more Burke plays this, this Galway team, the more that understanding will develop as well. Yeah. So as a final thought on Galway, they're right in the mix here this year. Yeah. Yeah, no team will want to play Galway later on the year, Joe. Absolutely. I'm, I'm including like Dublin, and Kerry, a Mayo, you know what I mean? These, they're all 50-50 games. But okay. Galway definitely have the, the ammo. The, the one thing about Galway I'd slightly worry about is the loss of Lean Silk. I know Malloy is just coming back. It'll be interesting to see, you know, does he get? It's very tight season for him to get back to, to fitness in a in short term. But Silk is a huge loss. Like Kelly's obviously a man marker. Johnny Gl- or Jack Lynn is a, is a man marker, but he had a really tough time in Murta. But I'm just thinking of the doublers and the carries later on down the year, down the year when you need the big defenders to the one on one matchups. You saw what Silk did at Sean O'Shea last year in the final, he had a brilliant game. So that loss just might come back to bite them. A fine for Joyce and nearly heading on a plane to New Zealand and, 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 and getting them back, you know, and say, we're going at this for three months to win the All Ireland because he, he literally could be the difference. But uh, they're right up there, Joe, yeah, for sure. Dublin Leash. Dublin 4.30 they scored 15 points in the second half so they eased off uh, touch so this was uh, you know akin to before standards started slipping Dublin would just rout teams because everything was just in such fine working order but but even that's reading too much into what we saw really I'm curious back when you were playing and, and this rivalry was the dominant one and you knew there was a good chance one way or another you were going to have to beat Dublin to win in All-Ireland when they were pummeling the likes of Leash 4.30 would you as a player make a point of watching that game as a group would you ever discuss or watch that game or was it completely just disregarded as utterly irrelevant like for, for the neutral for me 
it is irrelevant really mm. uh, w- would you guys have looked to take something out of it will Kerry and Galway and the rest be looking at that game in any way closely I, I wouldn't imagine Joe no like you referenced when we were up against them like these hammers in Leinster especially was a yearly thing so where are you looking usually at them no it was more kind of from a quarter final on you know when you might be meeting them or when they're playing against better teams when you could see patterns their play but look at the last day look Fergus point for Leash number one uh, Dublin, it's interesting. I look at. I know it's Leash, and I know they're not going to be hugely challenged against Leash. But that moment, Kirk Kenny hand passed the ball over the bar against against Derry and yeah. in Celtic Park, like they scored ten go- ten ten goals in four games since that. You know when they weren't scoring a huge amount previously. So I just wonder is that a change in their mindset, even against the likes of a Leash? Mm-hmm. You know, even you know they scored four against Derry who are who are notoriously hard to break down as well. Like so, I'm just wondering is that a moment now when they're saying if there's half a goal chance on or half a snip we're going for it and they might feel they need that rootless streak back in them to go and win the All-Ireland and win the big games down the line against the Kerrys or whoever is the Goals or the Mayos so that's really, really interesting but um, look at did what they did they did yeah. what we knew they were going to do against Leash it was a it was a right off the game so uh, yeah was. move on maybe <laughs> I think so four different goal scorers but uh, yeah. beyond that not much to say we have to stop at Mead this is quite something, isn't it? Um, I mean, in some ways it's not because this is where Mead football is of late. Mm. But uh, if you've any sense of tradition to see Mead in the Talchin Cup is uh, one of those startling moments. And Colin O'Rourke said we're exactly where we deserve to be. Anthony Moyles was on our AM show. He did not paint a good picture of the situation. Is not hearing great things about the camp. You know, he half referenced, I don't want to misquote him or, or, or paraphrase him wrongly but even he noted for instance that oh, Colm O'Rourke on the Tommy Tiernan interview talked about burning Dublin flags in jest admittedly but like mm. that O'Rourke team they were obsessed with Dublin and now you have a Meath County where I would say a huge number of available players are from Dublin families so you know it's not like let's gather around and, and, and talk about our hatred of Dublin kind of a vibe anymore so is there a, a connect there or, 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 or a disconnect there who knows and then their style of play, I, I, like, it's been called unstructured or lacking in a, in, a, in a plan. And then they don't have a marquee forward. Like, I could just keep on listing the the grim problems. Mm. Uh, they're in dire straits, really. They are, Joe. But you know what? I, I'd nearly like to start about talking about Offaly, to be honest, because, you know, what a win that is for them when you consider all them boys have been through in the last six weeks with losing their manager, mm. Lean Kearns, and come out and win a... And uh, a Leinster quarter final against me. I was on with John Duggan on Saturday actually, and I, I, I said if if me, if Offaly can get out of the blocks early, and make a good start, then it piles the pressure on me just at the circumstances they're in and everything that was riding on the game. It was almost a free shot for Offaly, and you could see the celebrations of the final whistle and the Offaly voice. Like it was unbelievable. Yeah, to be honest. Well, like they're dropping to their knees like they won in All yeah. Ireland. But I think it was just pure emotion, Joe, of everything they've been through in the last yeah. six weeks. And I'd say, in the, especially leading up to the game, I'm sure they would have been referenced Lean Kearns an awful lot. You know what I mean? And all the prep would have been based around that. And uh, you know, what a win for them! Brilliant. It's always, it's always a lot time. of it's always a lot of pressure. That isn't it? Let's do it for someone beloved who's departed. Because then, if you don't win or you don't perform, it's very hard. You feel really awful about really? that it's, it's a it's a tricky enough territory to delve into but I suspect they did I suspect you're right I, I, do you know what you're, you're right in a way Joe but I think I think even there's a nearly a, a comforting fact a comforting fact if you leave absolutely everything out there sure. you know what I mean in, in respect to that person or whatever the cause is you know just absolutely into yourselves and give everything and don't be looking the following day waking up far more and saying I like, 20% more in me into the tank, give everything, and something can happen from that. And you can see they absolutely flew out of the blocks and put the pressure on me. So now go back to the the, the scenes at the final was absolutely brilliant. But looking for me, like where did he start really? Like they had that win against Cork, I think in the first round of the league, and you know we're almost thinking of me on the way back here. But everything since that really has been on a dire a downhill spiral. And it's never good when you hear the likes of an ex player, the likes of an Anthony Moyes or someone like that because. They usually have good enough information as close enough sources to the camp. And if, thing, if they're hearing things aren't good or, or 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 whatever else it is, then they might be too far wrong. So you would be worried for me, for sure. But I think I, I listened to a bit of that podcast as well. And I think he mentioned that me can't see themselves being above the Tashin Cup. I think that's really important for me. I actually wrote for the Irish Murrah halfway through the league, Joe, that 
I thought Meath would be far better off being in the Tatchin Cup. This is after about round four, round, round three, round four, when you, you could see they're on a bit of a slump because they're not good enough to be in the race for Sam Maguire. Let's be honest. Like, what benefit would it be to them playing the top teams later on in the year? You could only see them getting a couple of bad beatings. So I think this could be a starting point and a reset button for Colin Rourke if he can get a response out of his team. Go on a good run now in the next six, seven, eight, nine weeks, whatever it is in the Tatchin Cup. Try and get to the latter stages, try and win it and give themselves a building block or a foundation to build for next year. But I think if it goes the opposite way, if they had a disaster of a Tatchin Cup, um, that doesn't leave them in a good place starting back training next October, uh, November, whatever it is. So I think there's a really critical period coming up here for Mead Football and Colm and Roche tenure as well in the next in the next couple of weeks. Mm. Clock against us, as always, to touch an Ulster. Yeah. I don't think it's a huge shock given the year that Donegal football has had that they didn't get the job done against Down and just to crystallise how far they've fallen two years ago in Uri Donegal put 225 on Down and now here they are I saw Aidan O'Rourke speaking afterwards their manager and he said we turned the ball over we didn't track runners for goals these were things we had talked about and worked on in advance of the game so that's never a good sign when you have a manager uh, sort of seething mm. quietly. Uh, uh, maybe there's some kind of disconnect there. I don't know. But um, uh, it, it's very hard to see Tony Gold turning it around this year. And so th- there's almost a degree of like writing off the entire year. You know what, Joe? I'm just wondering are, are the Tony Gold players thinking at this stage, yeah, look, we just need this year to end. Wrap you know, I, I, yeah. I couldn't imagine they're enjoying it at the minute up there, just with everything's going on. I couldn't imagine Aidan O'Rourke is enjoying this at the minute. Yeah, you know, if you're you're thinking if there's if there's a bit of fight look, I'm not saying there's not a bit of fight in Tony Gold. Like, of course they, they go to to down hoping to win the game and trying to win the game. But to be honest, Joe, I saw that Tony Gold team announced on Friday and my first thoughts were that's the weakest Tony Gold team I remember for a long, long time, yeah, right. you know what I mean? So, so it should be a shock. It's not a shock, though, so let's be honest. Uh, I'm sure it wasn't a shock to down either. You know, I, I I think they were fully expected going into this game to win. And like they've done a complete 360. They were where Johnny Gall were last year. Like this time last year, Joe, down were a mess. Yeah. An absolute mess. You know, there was all that stories about the training camp up in Dublin and Carton House and that went pear-shaped on them. You know, they were gone the first round of the Tatchin Cup. And look what look what can be done in a year. So they nearly should take a bit of inspiration mm-hmm. if you want from down. You know what I mean? But where they go for this year, I, I, I can't see them doing anything in the group stage, to be honest. And yeah, maybe maybe them Johnny Gold boys will be happy if they if, if they just the year ends as soon as possible for them because it doesn't look like they're going to get out another year for sure. No. A last one. I don't know how much you saw of Armaz win against uh, Cavan. Mm. 114 to 12 points. I saw a graph showing Cavan taking all manner of pot shots from uh, not ideal uh, situations. More Killian O'Connor uh places than uh, the rest of us mere mortals on Armagh we talked about them on the afternoon they were relegated and we were wondering why they had gone away from their style of football which was uh, so much more effective and, and, and attacking last year did we see them moving back towards last year's football or, or, or still not so sure about their direction Oh, definitely in the first half, Joe. Yeah, I thought they were excellent in the first half. To be honest with you, I thought they were back to their best okay. of the of, of what they played last summer. They were superb in the way they moved the ball through the lines and just kicking into Mernon and Turbot, especially Connor Tur. Like Mer- Turbot was on fire, kicking point seven in total. Mernon has become one of my favorite players to watch in the in the, in the GA because I love boys who can just win their own ball, and he's just the type of player you. Yeah, you can just kick 10 balls into them and he's probably going to win eight or nine and they can be any type of ball. And like like Ian Burke was spoke about earlier on, he's not a huge scorer, but he'll bring other people into the game. And that was very that was very evident in the first half. Grugan, Jason Duffy, all them boys were flying in the first half. Right. Their man looked really, really good. Make uh, you wonder what they were doing during the league then. Yeah, well, you, you spoke about it a while ago, Joe. Are they hiding something? Are they holding something back? Maybe they were. I don't know. Maybe they just thought weather conditions, this doesn't suit us. But... Uh, it was very up. Now it was noticeable during the second half. They did change tack and they were a lot more defensive and they set back. Like I think when Bring Bring Creeley scores that goal on the 34th minute, puts them one ten to four up. They only score another four points in the next 40 minutes of play. Okay. So they really just set back and conserved and set inside the 45. And you mentioned Cavan there and their shots. I think I think they've 19 shots or something like that in the second half compared to Armagh's nine. So it kind of showed that 
Armagh were letting them have the ball, but Armagh Cavan were weren't able to get the, the shots off in the right area. So, you know, more Cavan in the fir- or Armagh in the first half. I'd love to see going forward. And like I said about Galway earlier on, no one's going to want to play Armagh if they're playing like that because they have to. Like that was our mad team where Reno Need just comes in in the second half too. So when he gets back fully fit, I expect them to be down this Sunday and get to the Ulster final, and that would be a cracking, a cracking game against a Derry or a Monon. I presume in a game like that, McGinney's not saying, right, second half, let's now work our defensive game. Let's let's sit back and and work on that. I presume, are, would they be treating Ulster championship matches like that? It's very difficult to know, Joe. Like what changed for them is they certainly gave up a lot more possession. You know, and they definitely sit did sit a lot more. I can't remember any really flowing counter attacks or times when they kicked the ball inside, um, like they were doing in the first half. I, there was a small bit of a breeze, but nothing really that was worth talking about, or nothing that was heavily referenced on the GA goal coverage. So, yeah. what it was, I don't know. But the fact that Cavan were so dominant in possession has to lead you to say, did our man just say, right, we're just going to sit in here now and yeah. swab it and try and hit them a bit on the counter attack? Yeah, maybe. I'm sure there's still a bit of shadow boxing going on at this stage of the mm. year. 